All right, good morning. In uh, equipping hour this morning, we're going to continue our look at the doctrine of salvation. And uh, let's take a few moments and pray and ask the Lord's help for our time this morning. Lord, it truly is a privilege to be here, to be with your people, to be here with your people with our Bibles open. Uh, your word is our anchor, it is our light uh, for our feet, for our path. God, we pray that we would see things the way that you do, that we would embrace your ways of thinking and knowing. God, we need you. We are so desperately dependent on you for every single breath, every heartbeat, and certainly for knowledge. And so we ask that our minds, our thoughts, especially as it relates to salvation, would conform to your own. So help us in this by your word and by the power of your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this is part two of Salvation 101, and we're looking at the doctrine of soteriology. That's the big fancy word that simply means a study of salvation. And last week, we began thinking about what it means to be saved by asking the really fundamental question, what are we to be saved from? And this morning, we're going to continue our discussion of the doctrine of salvation, and for the next few weeks, we'll just be looking at a sort of systematized discovery of what the Bible teaches about the doctrine of salvation. And it's critical that we think about the word save. The word save, when we talk about being saved, getting saved, having been saved, when we talk about the doctrine of salvation, that word saved is a critical word. It implies need. And it implies need in our helplessness. If you need to be saved, it means that you are not able to extricate yourself from your predicament. You need outside help. Uh, with a friend was uh, talking to a religious man earlier this week, and he described his own pathway to heaven and what he thought was the universal pathway to heaven, which is try pretty hard, kind of hard, do your sort of best to do good, to do enough good, and maybe in the end you just kind of hope that God's going to be okay with it, that He's going to admire your efforts. And as we drew him out a little bit, he even admitted that God would be obligated, if you had done enough, and he couldn't tell us what enough was, that God would in fact be obligated to give you what is due. In fact, without knowing Romans 4.4, 4, he articulated it very well. I'll read what Paul says in Romans 4.4. 4. To the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. And you understand this, and, and you may not be old enough to have actually ever punched into a time clock. Uh, I would love a show of hands. How many of you ever used a mechanical time clock? Ka-chunk. Oh, wow. A lot of people. Okay. And you know that you get your time card and the, the little clock punches it when you checked in and when you checked out and at the end of your two weeks, you turned it into your employer and the employer looked at the card and wrote a check for what was due. And the dollars had to match the time stamp on the card. The employer rendered what you had earned. And when you think about the human predicament, we have to start with the fundamental realization that when we punch our time card in before God, we punch in sin, depravity, immorality, rebellion, degeneracy, over and over and over again. It's all there is on our time clock, 24-7, 365 and a quarter. And when you show up at God's door, <laughs> show up at His office with that time card, and, and if he were to give you what is due, all that could be rendered would be judgment. All that you have earned is his fury for even the best of your works on the earth. And so to talk about the pathway to heaven in terms of salvation is the right frame of mind. And a very religious man we were talking with this week talked about the pathway to heaven in terms of working and receiving what is due. And you couldn't have two more contrary paths because if anyone is going to get into heaven, it will not be on the basis of his works. 
It will not be on the basis of what he has done. It will be solely on the basis of God's favor, unobligated grace. And that grace is in the gospel. So we're just going to keep talking about some of the various categories and ways of talking about salvation from a systematized view of what the Bible says about it. And this morning, we're going to perhaps look at four topic areas under the heading of salvation. First, we're going to just talk about salvation in the Bible. What is the relationship of the doctrine of salvation to the rest of the Bible? And I might ask it this way, is salvation the theme of the Bible? And you might be tempted to say, well, yes. <laughs> and I would say no. And that might be striking or shocking, perhaps. Certainly for the Christian, the uh, theme in the Bible is salvation. And in terms of what, when I read the Bible and what has the Bible introduced me to, it's introduced me into this grace in which I now stand. And so for me, at a personal, pragmatic level, this book is all about a saving God who rescues sinners. But you have to understand, this is not the only thing the Bible is about. To talk about the theme of the Bible is different than talking about themes in the Bible. Do you understand the difference? There are motifs, there are themes, there are storylines in the Bible, and, and they are all interwoven in God's big story. But if we were to summarize the theme of the Bible, or perhaps a thesis statement of the Bible, or the one thing the Bible is about, you cannot boil the Bible's message down to salvation, that God saves sinners. Why is that? In equipping hour, you are allowed to talk a little bit. That's okay. Yeah, number one, it's not about us. And the foil to that, it is fundamentally about God's glory. And that glory is manifested in a really key fact that is the opposite of the doctrine called universalism. What do we mean by that? Not everybody gets saved. Not all sins are forgiven. Not all humans are atoned or brought into an at-one situation with the holy God of the universe. So to trace out as the theme of the Bible, God saves sinners, is to leave out significant portions of the Bible where people die and they face judgment and an eternity apart from the goodness and saving grace of God. And we can't leave that out. If we paint the theme of the Bible as salvation, we automatically leave out a theme that's very important to God. In fact, we looked at the heartbeat of this from the lips of Jesus in Luke 11 last week. I have come to cast fire on the earth, he says in Luke 11:49. 49. And how I wish it were already kindled, but I'm going to the cross. <laughs> Did Jesus come to save sinners? Yes, absolutely, to lay down his life as the perfect innocent substitute in the place of sinners who believe. Is it the only thing Jesus will do? John 5, 12 says that the Father set up the Son as judge of all men. It is Jesus who will judge those who do not believe the gospel. And so if we think about the theme of the Bible, we probably need to come up with something along the lines of the glory of God manifested in God saving sinners and judging sinners or something like that. I won't develop a, an equipping hour time to that theme. But it's got to be something like that that encompasses all of what the Bible details in God's own self-disclosure. God wrote this book. He details the self-disclosure of his own nature and purposes that he wanted us to know in this book. And what has God said? That he would save sinners who believe and he will judge sinners who do not. There's a way to encapsulate all that the Bible says uh, in, a, in a more total theme than simply salvation. And that means that the Bible is not only a tract, as it were, uh, an invitation unto eternal life. It certainly is that and contains that. Uh, but it is not the only purpose for the Bible and not the only way the Bible can be summarized. A second question about the relationship of salvation in the Bible relates to how we understand the Scriptures. Right, the, the big college word for this is hermeneutics. Uh, hermeneutics is the set of principles used to understand something. Whether or not you know it, you've been using hermeneutics every time you read an email or a text. 
It is just simply a stated or unstated set of principles for understanding something that's written. And when we apply the principles of hermeneutics to something, uh, we are doing exegesis or we are interpreting. And when we apply hermeneutics to the Bible, we are seeking to understand the meaning of the Bible. How does salvation relate to the hermeneutics of the Bible? And I would just say, first of all, hermeneutics is hermeneutics, whether you're dealing with the Bible or otherwise. That is, language works according to the way God designed language, and language is designed to be understood. And the Bible, like other forms of communication, employs language and grammar and words designed by God to be understood, and God set out to be understood, to be obeyed, and to disobey God comes with consequences. All of that means that God spoke so as to be clearly understood and heeded. The Bible is not a book of mysteries waiting for somebody to unlock all the mysteries with some secret decoder ring, some secret key. No, the Bible operates according to the fundamental dictates of what language is. And so when we come to the Bible and we begin to ask the question, how shall I understand the Bible? Is there some interpretive key that's going to unlock secret meanings in texts? And many people today would say, yes, salvation is that key. Salvation becomes not an understanding from the text, what did God clearly say, what did God clearly mean by what God said, and out of that emerges the doctrine of salvation, and we can exegetically derive that and systematically organize it, like we're doing this morning. But no, salvation now becomes the filter, the umbrella under which the Bible sits. Salvation then becomes the authority, the lens through which I read all of Scripture. And my friends, that would be problematic. As salvation is a favorite doctrine. <laughs> Look, if there were no doctrine of salvation, we wouldn't be here. There would be no joy, no hope. We would all be dead in our transgressions and sins. And the possibility of being in God's glorious presence and not being incinerated, but actually enjoying it, would be absolutely gone. We need the doctrine of salvation. We love the doctrine of salvation. We love God's grace, and we love the gospel. We will plant our flag right there. And yet, even that, a favorite doctrine, cannot be an interpretive lens. And we'll save for another equipping hour uh, the discussion of all the various uh, titles and strategies and hermeneutical systems that inappropriately try to make one doctrine or one idea as the interpretive lens for reading Scripture. Our task is simply to let Scripture say what Scripture says, to let God have His voice and let Him communicate. So, that may provoke a bunch of questions, and we're probably due for another quipping hour at some time on hermeneutics and soteriology. We're going to move on to our second topic, and this is the problem of God. The problem of God. I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 34. As we think about salvation, we think about ourselves as the problem. And I even said to you last week, you cannot be saved until you realize that you are the problem. We're going to turn the tables a little bit this morning and talk about God as the problem. And, and we might say this in quotes a little bit, there certainly is no problem with God, no problem with His character. He is good through and through. He is the fundamental definition of what is good. Uh, there is no shadow or darkness in Him at all. He does not sin and can't be tempted by sin. God is always good. But the problem for us fundamentally as it relates to how do sinners get to heaven, the problem is God. He's right there in the way. Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, detail some of this. Yahweh passed by in front of Moses and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave unpunished. 
and some of your Bibles have the insert, he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and the grandchildren of the third and fourth generations. What do we make of these two verses? That God in his fundamental nature is compassionate, gracious, forgiving, and he doesn't let the guilty go. He does not leave unpunished. How do these two realities go together? That God is a God of justice and doesn't leave unpunished. And God is a God who forgives in compassion and grace. What would it be like to be Moses and hear these words for the first time? Moses, aware of his own sin. What would it be like for Moses' hearers, the Israelites in the wilderness, to hear these words for the first time? They had seen the ground opened up and entire populations swallowed. They knew their own, our own hearts and the propensity towards idols, worshiping any old thing that'll, that'll be uh, fashioned out of their earrings. How would they hear this? How, how, how would Jews over the centuries read these two verses and understand them? This is a problem. And it's not problematic in the sense that it's contradictory. But it is a conundrum that leaves sinners scratching their heads. How can this be? How is there a God who is gracious and forgiving and compassionate who doesn't leave unpunished? That is the problem of God. That is the fundamental crux of the Bible, pun intended. The word crux, of course, comes from the word cross. That is the fundamental problem of humanity solved only by God. This is why we talk about the doctrine of salvation. Sinners need to be saved. These two verses don't leave a sinner with anything to do but look to God, to Yahweh, who is gracious and compassionate and forgives. And the Bible unfolds how exactly God does this. How does he maintain his own reputation as holy and just and not leaving unpunished? How does he maintain that reputation and still forgive sins? The religious man that, that Kyle and I were talking to earlier this week said, oh, yeah, God forgives. That's the only thing he could come up with. God forgives. But, but not like a Santa Claus who just reads the naughty list and then says, ah, oh, you know what? The kid gets a skateboard anyway. Something much more profound must take place. When we're talking about the infinite justice of God, when we're talking about the holiness of God and the vindication of His name that must take place when sin happens in His holy awareness. Something much more profound must happen than a winking at sin, a letting bygones be bygones. I want to turn to a couple of passages in Job. Job chapter 9. Job, in the midst of his misery, bewilderment, says, verse 2, In truth, I know that this is so, but how can a man be in the right before God? It's a great question. If one wished to dispute with God, he could not answer him once in a thousand times. Wise in heart and mighty in strength, who has defied God without harm? And in Job 9.32, God is not a man as I am, that I may answer him, that we may go to court together. There is no umpire between us who may lay his hand upon us both. It's not as if man as the problem and God as the problem 
have some sort of intermediary, some arbiter, some umpire that can put one hand on one and one hand on the other and bring two parties that are at enmity with each other, they're at odds with each other and say, can't you guys just get along? Here, you give a little bit, you give a little bit, we'll compromise, love is right in the middle. The problem with man is his sin. And the problem, should we call it that, the problem for man with God is his holiness. And the truth is, God won't flinch on his holiness. Man can't fix his sin. So we are at an impasse. Is there an umpire? Is there someone who can lay hands on both and solve the problem? Of course, the answer to that is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God and man. But the answer isn't in the middle ground. Turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Really remarkable scene in Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord holy and lifted up the train of his robe, filled the temple. Probably the hem at the edge of his robe filled the temple. The smoke, the fiery ones hovering, covering, crying out, holy, holy, holy. And the voices of the fiery ones, the seraphim, made the foundations of the temple shake. And they are crying out as creatures, God, you are holy, you are different. <laughs> and Isaiah's terrified, undone, ruined. Look what Isaiah says here in verse 5. Woe is me, cursed am I, damnation upon me. I am ruined, I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. Isaiah recognizes his own filth and the collective filth of God's people. And he's undone. And he's undone because he's in the presence of the King, Yahweh of hosts. And then something happens in the temple complex. Something happens at the altar a seraphim flies and brings a burning coal and places it on Isaiah's lips and cleanses. There is divine activity here that brings about a resolution. And then Isaiah would go and be a spokesman for a saving and judging God to a hard-hearted people that wouldn't listen. This woe in Isaiah 6, 5 comes after some previous woes. I want you to see these. Turn back to chapter 5, verse 8. God had looked for justice. He only found bloodshed amongst the people. Verse 8, woe to those who add house to house and join field to field till there is no room so that you have to live alone in the midst of the land. Verse 11, woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may drink and pursue strong drink, who stay up late in the evening, that wine may inflame them. They have music and banquets. Go on further to verse 18. Woe to those who drag iniquity with the cords of falsehood and sin as if with cart ropes, who say, let, us, let God make speed, let him hasten his work that we may see it. Verse 20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. They substitute darkness for light and light for darkness. Woe to those, verse 21, who are wise in their own eyes. Verse 22, woe to those who are heroes in strong drink. These curses, these damnations from God justly upon sinful people. In chapter 5, directed at God's set-apart people. And when Isaiah comes into the presence of the king of kings, he calls those same curses down upon himself. This is a, a right perspective on who God is and who we are as sinners in His presence. 
Let's look thirdly this morning at the dilemma of Proverbs 17, 15. Turn to Proverbs 17, 15. This is perhaps another way to frame the same situation. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. We really appreciate this in terms of human law courts, don't we? To, to justify the wicked and to criminalize the innocent, oh, those are abominable. And when we see those tragedies played out in our own day in the civil courts and the legal courts of our own jurisprudence, and you see the guilty go free, and you see the innocent locked up, you know, you, re you rejoice when DNA evidence exonerates a man after he's been in jail for 25 years and they let him out and he meets his grandkids for the first time. And our hearts just ache when criminal miscreants are released with no punishment to go do more and greater crimes. And so we rejoice with this verse when it comes to human justice. Yes, God, that's right. Justify the wicked, abomination. Condemn the righteous, abomination. But when we think on the grand scale, the vertical scale between us and God, wow, Proverbs 17, 15 means we're in a lot of trouble. Because to declare righteous the abominably guilty is itself damnable before God. It's an abomination. And to condemn the innocent alike is an abomination. And when we think about this dilemma, this is a real problem, a real problem for the wicked, a real problem for the ungodly. And we fast forward a little bit to the solution. In striking verbiage in Romans 4, 5, we could go a lot of places to look at the solution, but I find this one particularly beautiful and difficult simultaneously. I read to you earlier Romans 4, 4, to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but what is due. If salvation, if we could even call it salvation, is by works... You're not really being rescued. You're just being paid off for what you've achieved. The next verse says, but the one who does not work, but to that one who believes in God, who justifies the ungodly, that is, he declares righteous the ungodly, that man's faith is credited as righteousness. Well, this is the solution but if we've got Proverbs 17, 15 in our minds, what kind of solution is this? It's an abominable one by God's definition because God is here saying to the one who has faith in Jesus Christ, the innocent one who was condemned, that one's faith in Christ is credited as righteousness because he, the ungodly, was declared righteous on the basis of that faith. And, and to declare the wicked righteous is an abomination. And to condemn the innocent is an abomination. What do we say of that? We, we say the cross is an abomination. <laughs> and we understand that what happened there was the unfurling of God's infinite right fury, His damnation, the outpouring of infinite hell on the innocent one who knew no sin, who became sin on our behalf 
so that we might become God's righteousness in him, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. That is the answer. And this is the answer that the self-righteous, religious trips over every day. I want to, I got, I got to earn this. Well, have you done enough? I don't know. I hope so, but I got to earn it. And God knows that is hopeless. Worse than hopeless, because of our depravity, we place our hope in ourselves and we feel like we are the light at the end of the tunnel. And that will come crashing down at the end. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is what? Death, eternal death, a destruction that never ends. God's solution to this dilemma. How does God keep his own reputation? Just, holy, righteous, I will visit the iniquity. I will not let sin go unpunished. Listen, there's no sin you have ever committed, Christian, that goes unpunished. Taken by Christ at the cross if you're forgiven. And if you're here this morning or listening and your sins are not forgiven, you must understand there is not a careless word or a stray thought or any dirty deed or any so-called righteous deed that's actually filthy rags before God that will not go unpunished. And every moment spent resisting the kindness of God stores up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when it will be unleashed. It's a remarkable thing. I I don't know if you've ever thought about the, the audacity at one level of asking God to forgive your sin. Have you thought about this? Theologically, in a 2 Corinthians 5, 21 way, in a Romans 4, 5 way, in a John 3, 16 way, in a substitutionary atonement way. God, here, here's what I'd like to make a deal with you. Here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to take all of my filth and I'd like you to put it on your perfect son and clothe him in it, wrap him in it, and, and hang him between earth and sky on a torturous Roman cross of ignominy and shame. And I want you to hang him there in the full court of heaven in full view of your holiness wrapped up in all of my filth. And and, and it is just a trade. Could you give me his righteousness? Could you clothe me in that? Can I I have his robes? So that when you look at me, you just see all of his perfect beauty and, and when you look at him, you just see all of my... God, could you do that for me? That is what we are asking And God, who is gracious and compassionate and who forgives, wants sinners to ask just that. And when we invite people to the cross, we're inviting people to that abomination, that scandal, that awful, beautiful, glorious, wonderful cross. cross is an abomination, and yet it is our only hope, and so we cling to it. We sing it, we proclaim it, we tell others. Let's move on. Number four this morning, as we think through systematizing the doctrine of soteriology, I just want to hint at this, and the notes have um, like probably eight pages of notes here online you can look at. But I want to introduce God's promise, number four this morning, God's promise of rescue. And I want you to turn to Genesis chapter three. And John, in his introduction to the gospel of Mark, traced out this promise, the seed promise, the proto-gospel in Genesis 3.15, and and led us right up to the introduction of Mark and the incarnation of Christ and the coming of the seed promise to rescue sinners. I would encourage you to go back and listen to that intro to Mark uh, to, to fill this out more fully. But I want us to think about the fact that Genesis 3.15 and following 
happens right on the heels of the fall of man in Genesis 3, 1 to 14. I know that sounds obvious. (laughs) But it is really remarkable that immediately after the fall of man, after Adam and Eve rebelled against God, we have God speaking to the snake. We have God speaking to Satan, who has taken on the form of a snake, and he says in verse 15, I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and then notice the change in pronoun, he shall bruise you on the head, singular, masculine, and you shall bruise him on the heel. This is a remarkable passage. When we think about the, the, the fall of man, and we think about what God does immediately after the fall, God makes this promise. In, in talking to Satan, he's saying, you're dead meat. You will be crushed. And you will be crushed by a seed of the woman. And if you think about Adam and Eve, they're in the garden. The only persons that they know of that exist at this point are God, Satan incarnated in a talking snake, and Adam and Eve. They've never seen reproduction except in the world of vegetation. What did God say as he filled the earth with vegetation? Trees bearing seed after their kind. So Adam and Eve knew that a watermelon seed would produce a watermelon vine, producing watermelons, producing watermelon seeds that would produce a watermelon vine. And a watermelon seed wasn't going to produce an orange tree. There there was a seed principle already for them in place when God made this promise. And God is telling the snake that a woman will have seed, and that seed will crush the snake. So right out of the gate after the fall, you have a promise that God is going to undo what has been done in really dramatic fashion. How will this play out? And and the rest of your Bible is the unfolding of this promise. God makes a down payment on this very shortly thereafter. God gives them clothes. Where did God get these clothes? They were skins of animals. You get skins of animals in in our day by killing animals. I know there's faux fur. Leave that aside for a moment. Um, But you get a skin of an animal through the death of an animal. I think the implication here by God clothing Adam and Eve with the skins of animals meant he was going to replace their fig leaf attempt at self-righteous religious covering of their sin and shame, which God saw right through. And he was instead going to cover their shame with something else, something that required the death of an innocent substitute. Really remarkable pictures right here at the beginning of God's history of the world. What happens next? In Genesis 4, of course, Adam and Eve have a seed. Verse 1, she conceived and gave birth to Cain, and she said, I have gotten a man-child, Yahweh. And again, I refer to you to John's introduction to Mark to deal with, uh, to think through what is, what is Eve saying there? If, If the only people she knows are Yahweh, Adam, Satan and herself, and if you were just to collect all of that population and say, okay, who's going to solve this problem? What kind of seed could possibly crush the head of the snake and undo all the ruin that we brought about? Uh, Probably not the snake, not my husband. It's not going to be me. Who's left? Yahweh. It, It is in Eve's speech here an anticipation of the incarnation. Somehow Yahweh was going to come, be a part of this seed plan, Uh, There's a little bit of mystery there, and I think that's intentional. It builds an anticipation that we are supposed to understand and perhaps gets at anticipation that Eve herself is explaining here. And then she gave birth to Abel, 
And Cain wasn't the seed that crushed the snake, was he? He killed Abel. That means Abel wasn't the seed that crushed the snake either. And so Adam and Eve have another son, and she names her son what? Seed. <laughs> Seth. You understand what Eve is doing? She is anticipating the fulfillment of this promise, and the whole narration of biblical history is the unfolding of the anticipation of this promise. Who's going to crush the snake? Who's it going to be? And you walk down through the lineage. Why are genealogies so important in the Bible, so important to Jewish history and Jewish historians? Because the anticipation of the seed promise means it's going to come through the line of Eve, eventually through the line of Abram, eventually through the line of David, or Judah, and eventually David. Tracing this seed promise. And you walk through Noah. He's not it. Abram's not it. Isaac, Jacob, Judah, they're all swindlers and scoundrels. Moses, maybe that's the guy. He's not it. Doesn't even get to go into the promised land. You walk through the cycle of judges and it just gets worse and worse and worse in a downward spiral. You get to Saul. He's promising physically. David, finally a man after God's own heart and seed promises are reinstated in some magnificent ways, tracing Genesis 3.15 through Genesis 12 through 2 Samuel 7 and the Davidic covenant and the house of David and through the line of Judah. And you just think, okay, this has got to be the guy. He's not the guy. Solomon's not it. And you go through all the kings of Judah, they're not it. And what do we know in all of this? What are we looking for? We're looking for a seed, a son, we're looking for rest. We're looking for a reversal of the curse. And as you add land promises to seed promise, as you add Davidic rain promises, we're now looking for a land of blessing returned to Edenic beauty. We're looking to the, the, the beauty of agriculture and the flourishing of humanity. We're looking towards a king who will reign on the earth in righteousness. All of these things compiling in glorious hope but foiling against utter desperation and disappointment as we watch the traips and tram of humanity, one disappointment after the other. When is the seed of the woman going to come that's going to crush the head of the snake? We've seen priests and prophets and kings and judges and leaders. Human history is a parade of depravity and death. Right, very early on in Genesis 5, you start reading the he begat him, and he begat him, and he begat him, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. It's been the universal story. All of the Bible's heroes are tainted, some more imitable than others, but none of them are our hope. We get to John the Baptist. Could it be him? He's different. He's got weird clothes, eats weird food, calling people to repentance. Got his head lopped off, and he said, it's not me. And the one he pointed to, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's got to be him. And we've seen the sacrificial system. We've seen the countless parades of lambs slaughtered as innocent substitutes, a placeholder of the seed promise, a type a foreshadowing of that seed promise, a temporary installment pointing to our need, a regular bloody reminder of our sinfulness and the need of substitution and of God's gracious provision, all pointing to this one lamb. Jesus, of course, is called Emmanuel, God with us. He's called the Son of God and the Son of Man. He is a Son of David. He bears all the titles. He is the Messiah, the Christ. He is born with no father. He never sinned. He's of the line of Judah. He speaks things into existence like fish and bread and wine and hands. He casts out demons. He has power over Satan's henchmen. And everywhere he goes in his earthly ministry, it's like the spotlight of heaven is just right down on him and goes everywhere and erases the curse. The dead live, the blind see, the lame jump. Every disease is eradicated in this little spot of light where the light walks around on the earth amidst us. He is compassionate towards the weak. 
He calls out the self-righteous. He promises eternal life to all those who will believe in him. He has multiple showdowns with Satan and he wins in all the ways that Adam lost. In John 11, he speaks the dead out of their tombs. He is the Christ. He's the promised one. How does the snake, that serpent of old, the devil, react to the presence of this one? Well, he incited Herod to murder baby boys. He tried to get Jesus to kill himself. He incited the leaders in the crowds, and Jesus kept escaping out of their hands because his time had not yet come. He indwelt Judas, and then he finally succeeded. The plan worked. (laughs) Got to get rid of this guy. I know who he is. And ironically, beautifully, Satan's victory in killing the Christ was exactly what the Christ came to do to crush Satan. Satan's plan worked, and that was God's plan all along. The death blow dealt by the snake is really the death blow dealt to the snake. God employs the snake's murderous intent to accomplish the snake's utter undoing. 1 John 3, 8, the Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. In Colossians 2, 15, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. And the public display on a cross of shame that the world considers a scandal and weakness, something hideous, is actually the very place God's hold up, God holds up as a trophy of Satan's defeat and the victory for all who would believe. But Jesus is not done yet. The cross secured the victory, but the death blow has not yet been delivered. There is a an error in the Christus Victor theology that says Satan was crushed at the cross. He wasn't crushed at the cross unless being crushed means you still get to roam about the earth like a lion seeking whom he may devour. If being crushed means you still get to be the God of this world. If being crushed means you still get to blind the minds of unbelievers in the greatest global conspiracy of all time and keep people from the gospel. If being crushed means you still hold the power of the fear of death in your hands, No, Satan has not yet been crushed. There is a day coming for the prince of the power of the air who works in the sons of disobedience. There is a day coming for the God of this world. Jesus is coming, and he will have his day. I would encourage you to just read Revelation 19, 11 through 20, 10. And you walk through Satan's future history. And that future history, beginning in Revelation 19, is Jesus coming down to the earth, Satan amassing his armies, and it's not a battle that Hollywood would depict. It it doesn't have the kind of tension, the buildup, the the, we don't know how this is going to go, and then a final victory and denouement that a good story would have. It's just Jesus shows up, sword out of his mouth, Beast and the false prophet, that's the Antichrist and his right-hand guy, plucked, thrown alive into the lake of fire, Satan thrown in jail. Done. (laughs) Anticlimactic battle. Jesus has his day. So Satan gets locked up for a thousand years, no longer able to deceive the nations. And finally released one last time for one last non-epic battle that Jesus just wins. And Satan finally in Revelation 20 is cast into the lake of fire that was prepared for him. That is Satan's crushing. That is still yet future. That comes. But it's such great hope for us as we open our Bible to page one, page two. Man, what great pages those are. (laughs) And then page three. What a tragedy. And right there on page three, right on the heels of the tragedy, hope, salvation promised, victory guaranteed, God would send his Messiah 
through the woman. Genesis 3.15 is that starting point from which all the rest of the Bible unfolds. We see, of course, the sacrificial system which typify God's salvific work, and we see the massive rescues throughout biblical history where God puts his stamp on his own authority and power to rescue by giving physical demonstrations of rescue. Right, the Exodus is the paradigmatic rescue in the Old Testament that people would always look back to and they'd say, wow, yes, the Exodus, remember that. You know, for Texas, it's remember the Alamo. For Israel, it's remember the Exodus, the Red Sea, the destruction of Pharaoh's armies. They were never to forget it. David rescued time and again from his enemies. Jonah rescued from a fish. Esther being used to rescue God's people again and again. All of these things point to a development of a biblical soteriology that God is painting. And by the way, there's so many angles on soteriology. It's like a, a diamond. And somebody remind me, how many, how many facets are on a, on a well-cut diamond? 128 or what is it? Dave knows. What is it? 46? Okay, I was way off. That's a lot. 46 is a lot of facets. I was going to say two, but 46 is a ton. And if they're not cut right, and if they're not in the right amount, and they're not at the right angles, then the light coming in isn't able to reflect and bounce around and shoot out the table of the diamond in the way it's intended. And our salvation is so multifaceted and so beautiful, and the light of God's glory shines through it and one statement, one definition, one word, one picture, one verse cannot possibly capture all that God has for us in his soteriology, which is why we're going to take a number of weeks to do it, and it's why I'm going to stop here, and we'll pick up next week with the vocabulary of salvation, and we get to enjoy the really wonderful exercise of basically reading the dictionary. I like reading dictionaries. That's your cliffhanger. Show up for a quipping hour next week. You're dismissed.